Welcome to Wireless Future. I'm Emil Björnsson and I'm here today with Eric Larsson. How are you? Good morning, Emil. Good, how are you? Good morning, I'm great. And this is episode number 40, so we have been going on in this podcast for quite a while. 40, wow, that's amazing. I mean, 40 is like a birthday, right? So when did we actually start this project? I think it was in the autumn of 2020. Yeah, it was in 2020, during the COVID, in fact. Yeah, exactly. So we, aren't, we aren't at the four-year birthday yet, but we will we'll be approaching it. But we are at the uh, 40th episode, um, uh, exactly. let's say, <laughs> celebration. That's right, yeah. Right. And in this episode, I was thinking we will look back at something that we talked about earlier, but not that far back, because two episodes ago, you were mentioning about synchronization in mm. wireless networks, and you were promising, ah, we should talk about this in a and an episode in the future so let's do that today <laughs> yeah synchronization sure right uh, that's a yeah to start with that's a very broad topic and it's a fairly complicated topic and above all it's um, I think fair to say more complicated than what it might seem at the surface and it's also a topic that isn't dealt with so well in a lot of modern books on com theory and maybe MIMO <laughs> particularly, right? right? Because very often in, in like digital comms textbooks and first courses that we teach and, and especially the MIMO uh, com theory books and, and literature, we usually start off with um, with a signal, um, something of a sort like received signal is equal to transmitted signal plus noise, right? And this could be continuous time, something like x of t equal to s of t plus noise. Sometimes there is a linear filter in there, so x of t is an impulse response convolved with the signal plus noise. Um, and uh, typically we sample the model, so we work in discrete time, so something like uh, x sub n equal to an then convolution of an impulse response with the s sub uh, n plus noise. Um, but now in, in uh, reality to start with whatever we call a signal in all these models that always represents some physical quantity. Huh? Something mm. of the sort like a voltage that measured somewhere or a voltage that's fed to a or like used to control a voltage generator or something of that sort. And um, there are lots of effects here that will need to be properly modeled. I mean, to start with, communication channels are, well, to a good degree, they are linear time invariant, right, within a coherence time with a channel. But there will be all right. sorts of things going on, like nonlinearities in electronics. There'll be quantization as nonlinear and so on. But it'll also be the fact that for these models to even be well defined, the transmitter side and the receiver side will need a common notion of what time means. So if mm. I'm I'm X and you're Y, or whatever S we said. And <laughs> I say X of T and you say S of T. Okay, so does T have the same meaning for you and me, right? Do, are we talking about like the signal with respect to the same time reference? And um, th and that's one aspect of synchronization. Yeah. Uh, and another aspect is that typically we have models that are obtained by uh, demodulating or, or representing complex baseband, something that goes on at the narrowband carrier. And then we also need an agreement on what the carrier frequency is. Uh, so synchronization, I mean, most broadly speaking, is like about getting agreement on these things, right? What does time mean? What does frequency mean? And so on. Right. Um, and I think... It, it, this is an important point that you're bringing up that we, when we write textbooks and make courses, we, we focus on the thing that someone thinks is the essential things to really understand communication performance, what is the limits on performance that you can achieve. And then when we say a channel, we, we always think about uh, the channel between uh, the transmit and receive antenna when the wave propagates over the air, but it actually also includes the transmit the hardware and receive the hardware and then there's all kinds of hardware effects that we don't uh, usually model in textbooks and, and synchronization is certainly one of the important aspects there. I remember when we had some project course uh, uh, that the students had learned everything in our previous courses except the synchronization question. So uh, then my first question for you is really, so why do we need synchronization? Uh, can't we just uh, transmit the signal and then the, the receiver does it best to 
just untangle yeah. what we sent. <laughs> I mean, I mean, again, it comes down to um, the, the the model that we we alluded to here making sense, right? So that we can actually say that received s of x of t is your s of t plus noise, whatever, and. Uh, broadly speaking, the, there are a few different kinds of synchronization. So number one, uh, we need at least a coarse time synchronization. If we mm. think of like a modern system with OFDM, then transmitter and receiver will have to be synchronized in time within the cyclic prefix of the uh, OFDM symbol. So that any mismatch in timing just comes across as a, some additional access delay of the channel or can be absorbed in the impulse response and fits within the access delay of the channel. Right. So that's the number one thing. And, and that's kind of an easy thing because cyclic prefix is, is long in comparison. Uh, and the second aspect is frequency synchronization. So we have to agree on, on a carry frequency. My oscillator clock has to take at the same rate as yours so that when I say one gigahertz, then you, you, when I tune to one gigahertz, you also tune to one gigahertz. And if there is a mismatch here, that will turn into um, a leakage between subcarriers in the OFDM system. In an OFDM system, and that is well, that's not an easy problem, but it's a manageable problem. And, and typically, the way this is done and, and and has been done, I mean, for generations of systems, is that there there is a the signal, a synchronization signal broadcast by the, the system or by the base stations. Uh, one, one synchronization signal to get the course time sync and another one to get the course frequency sync. And everybody listens to this and does something of the sort like, well, maximum likelihood estimation or whatever to get timing and to get frequency sync. So, so these are the two main things. Right. And then there is the third, which is synchronization in phase, which is sometimes required. and. Then we should keep in mind here that for a narrowband signal, phase and time are essentially the same thing, right? Because we have a narrowband signal and we time delay it by, say, delta. That is equi- if delta is small enough, that's equivalent to phase shifting the signal by 2 pi fc delta. fc is the carrier. Hmm. Um, so in a way, time and time and phase synchronization are the same thing, but when I say coarse time synchronization, it happens at a much, much larger time scale when, when we talk about synchronizing phase. So when we talk about be, being synchronized in phase, then we're talking about um, delays less than a wavelength, um, phase rotations much less than, I mean, just a small part of the unit circle. And in terms of time, we're down to tens of, of picoseconds, obviously, depending on the carrier, but that's the order of magnitude that we're discussing. Right. So those are the three things: course time, frequency sync, and and sometimes phase sync or, or or phase alignment is another term that's being used. Yeah, and sometimes phase calibration, depending on on the exact context where we care about the phase. And I believe in this kind of scenario, time and frequency; these are two constants from a sort of theoretical point of view it's not like we consider that someone moves close to the speed of light so there is any time dilations or anything like that so uh, it's more that like the, in the hardware components we uh, just don't know the time and frequency uh, the exact one if there is such a thing uh, but th- there is some mismatch between the transmitter and receiver that's right i mean there's no relativistic effect here right i mean nobody moves that fast <laughs> uh, so, so that's true and then well, constant, I mean, um, oscillators or clocks that drive the electronics, they will drift over time. Mm-hmm. So even though we have like a, a even though the carrier frequency between transmitter and receiver differs at, at, at some point, then we, we adjust for, we estimate the difference and adjust for that. They will, their drift, they will continue to, to, to drift and this, this difference will have to be like re-estimated from time to time. But um, th- that's manageable. That's a manageable problem in general. So, um, so uh, I remember you talked about uh, things being narrowband. If I understand it correctly, it's sort of a, you have a certain carrier frequency. This, you have a signal that oscillates back up and down like a sinusoid, and then uh, some of the properties there is what you use to carry information. You might be slowly varying the amplitude at a much uh, slower phase, uh, which is sort of uh, oh, slower time delay so so it's sort of many o- oscillations before you change the amplitude or, or you might have some shifts uh, where you carry information here as well uh, so 
if you just change the amplitude, do you need to, to have face information at the receiver as well? I mean, if you do some kind of amplitude shift keying or something like that. Uh, Ooh, so let's break this down. So we're talking about a um, communicating with an narrowband signal here, right? Mm-hmm. And demodulating yes. coherently. So if you, if you want to demodulate face coherently, then you'll need the uh, receiver to uh, have an estimate of the carrier face. Mm-hmm. And the typical way of doing accomplishing that is to first send a, a pilot and then measure the face of the pilot and then you use the face of the pilot to, well, um, adjust your uh, this is done in software uh, typically I mean uh, algorithmically so that's entirely true uh, for, for coherent modulation you need um, um, you need um, to estimate the face of the carrier right yes so uh, I think in some of the basic digital communication textbooks when you consider different modulation schemes you have sort of amplitude and, and, and face or I and Q parts and you put out different points in the constellation diagram hmm. there i guess if you have a course time and frequency uh, synchronization but not phase then this constellation diagram at the receiver side will be rotated somehow and that 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 is entirely true yeah and if those rotations causes issues if you are using the phase to carry information this is a big problem if it's only amplitude you're using it might be be less of a problem that, that, that that's entirely true i mean so again let's break this down and talk about a point-to-point uh, uh, link where you send, where we send uh, information bearing signals using a, a carrier modulated or narrowband signal with uh, constellation points representing the, the I and Q of that narrowband signal. Then you'll see in the presence of a, a, a phase uh, misalignment, or if the receiver has not been able to estimate the carrier phase properly. That will show up as a rotation of your constellation diagram. So it will just appear like rotated. So rather than like in the textbooks, it will be just rotated by some angle. Yeah. And if there is a carrier frequency offset, that angle of rotation of your constellation diagram in turn will, will rotate over time. Right. Yes, and I think sometimes uh, this is maybe as deep as textbooks are, are mentioning some of these issues because the, there is, for example, the discussion about differential modulation schemes where you, you send a first signal uh, so you don't assume that exactly you know the rotations from the That's beginning, right. but you, you send a no- signal in the beginning and then you code information into how you move around in your constellation diagram for the, the rest of them. But, but, right, and uh, that might be a, a good point to make, in fact, that differential modulation, I guess differential PSK is the uh, standard thing that you can mm. find in textbooks. Demodulation of differential PSK is essentially equivalent to uh, sending a pilot or a reference signal or, or a demodulation reference signal, I think is the term, and then using that pilot to estimate the carrier phase and then demodulating the rest of the symbols coherently. So essentially you're just estimating how the constellation diagram is rotated. Right. So uh, I guess that is a principle we could use then. If I have a mobile phone that connects to a base station, my phone sends a pilot and then it sends a sequence of data and that's the uplink transmission. But if we then want to transmit back in the downlink, what can we do? Ha. Huh. So now this is going to get a little more technical here. I think mm. we should break this down by first understanding the uplink properly. So let's say that again, like in your um, set up here, that there is a, a mobile that transmits a, a narrowband signal. And uh, then we are receiving that signal through a receiving antenna. Mm. Mm. If that mobile just sends a, sends a pilot signal or a pilot symbol and then data symbols, all complex baseband, then the receiving antenna can estimate the, the face of the uh, received pilot mm. and that way get the face of the carrier and use that to rotate or compensate all the data symbols that follow sub- subsequently. Yeah? And that way get estimates of constellation points that lie properly in the complex plane, so without the rotation. Mm. And now in the uplink with multiple antennas, and these might be in a single array, they might be distributed, whatever, doesn't quite matter. Yeah, so in the uplink, then the mobile is sending the pilot. Every antenna does the same thing, estimates mm. the complex angle, or the, I mean the amplitude as well, but phase is really what's important here, mainly. 
so, so every antenna does the same. Estimates the complex um, uh, amplitude, or especially the phase of the uh, channel the, of the, or the carrier phase, and uses that to rotate the received data symbols. And once that rotation has been performed, the derotation rather, then those symbol estimates per antenna can just be coherently combined, just be summed up. Yeah? Mm. And this requires nothing this requires nothing in terms of synchronization or calibration among the antennas. Because all the data symbols undergo exactly the same propagation, the same phase rotation as the data symbols. And if the clocks in the antennas are off relative to each other, they don't. This doesn't matter. They will. They don't have to re- agree on a common phase reference or anything. Uh, there's no need for any synchronization or calibration among the antennas. Yeah, they could be driven by the same oscillator, by different oscillators. Doesn't matter. Of course, at some point, I mean, you'll need to send pilots frequently enough. Mm. If the oscillators drift over time, or if they are slightly off in frequency, so that these phases rotate over time, but there is no need for any sort of calibration or anything here among the antennas. Uh, so that's the uplink. Hmm? Now you asked about the downlink. Yes, exactly. So so now you have uh, th- this uh, multiple antennas uh, uh, at the base station, and you said, okay, we, we use the same pilots. Uh, you don't need to send multiple pilots, and, and you derotate the things, and, and then it's essentially like a textbook example w- with all of the, the different... Uh, yeah. Yes, so the, the uplink is easy. Now, the, down, the, the downlink is considerably more complicated. Mm-hmm. Uh, so in the downlink... What we want to do then with multiple antennas. And right now, let's make no assumptions on whether these antennas are co-located in an array or distributed or whatever. But we want them to cooperate phase coherently such that they can send all can send the same, let's say, QAM symbol to the mobile. And we want our transmissions to add up constructively at the mobile. Right. Now for this to function, these antennas will have to be jointly synchronized or calibrated in phase in some way. And the exact form of calibration that is required depends on the operation mode. Um, But one way to understand the fundamental need for such synchronization or calibration is just to consider that suppose that we know propagation exactly. Hmm? So we we, we live in a world where we know that um, there is a mobile and we have two transmitting antennas. Hmm? And these two transmitting antennas are one meter away from the mobile each. Suppose we know this. Mm. And suppose that we just want to send a direct impulse to the mobile. And we want to send this impulse in such a way that it's received simultaneously from both antennas. Now, for this to be possible at all, these two antennas will need to agree on when to perform that transmission. And so they will have to be synchronized in time. Um, that this is not how uh, we, 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 to start we don't transmit uh, impulses obviously, but but typically the way that trans- real transmission works in 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 MIMO and um, TDD MIMO in particular is by using reciprocity. So by estimating the channel from an uplink pilot, receiving that pilot at each antenna, uh, forming the complex conjugate of that pilot or of the channel estimate that it gives us, mm-hmm. yeah and then pre-rotating the transmitted signal by that complex conjugate. This is called conjugate beamforming or maximum ratio beamforming. And it turns out for that to work, these antennas will have to be calibrated or synchronized in phase relative to each other. Particularly, they will have to be reciprocity calibrated relative to each other. Uh, That is not exactly the same thing as them agreeing on like a global time reference. And explaining the difference, I think, goes slightly beyond what I could do here without using like math, and it's hard in a podcast show to to do. But I think we can. Um, but it's important to appreciate the, the 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 point and the fact that for joint coherent beamforming and downlink to work, the antennas that participate in the downlink transmission, when we use reciprocity based beamforming, will have to be synchronized to each other in phase or or calibrated specifically reciprocity calibrated sometimes this is if they are distributed in space the antennas then we say jointly reciprocity calibrated very often and another term that's being used here is aligned in phase Mm. so these are basically also um, 
synonyms. Mm. But, so let's see if I understand this properly. So, so in the uplink, you, you send this pilot and the data, and I guess in principle you can send the pilot last as well because you just store the received signals. You and could then... send the pilot to come any time, so assuming that the phases don't drift over time. So let's mm. say the oscillators are totally stable over time, just generate perfect sinusoids but they are off by some unknown phase relative to each other. Right. Then on uplink, you, I mean, your transmission has to contain a pilot. Actually, that's not, I'm not sure that's strictly true. There might be like algorithms you could decode blindly and so on, but let's not go there. But sending a single pilot is enough. Yeah. And there's no, the important thing is there is no need for any calibration or, or, or reciprocity calibration or synchronization or anything between the antennas on uplink. Just, just go ahead with the transmission. Yeah, <laughs> and my point there was sort of that the uh, you take the information from this pilot, and then in your computing, uh, you are doing this derotation, and then you add up the signal from different antennas. So you can do this afterwards. While in the That's downlink, right. it's really important that you do it first before the transmission occurs, in order for for the signal to add up over there instead of in the computer. That's right. That's uh, another good point. I mean, on downlink, there's also the, the, the causality requirement here that we need to know the channel state information before the transmission so we can pre-rotate. But, but in the context of understanding synchronization and, and calibration, and alignment then it's really the fact that it's not it's not enough to get the pilot these antennas actually have to agree on a phase reference relative to each other R right. for the joint transmission to even to to work yeah. and if you have sent this this pilot in the uplink you get some kind of phase information about what you should uh, derotate isn't it enough to just use this information and then send with the opposite phases in the downlink or it seemed like there's something more here right no or there is something more yes i mean mm -hmm. that, this is exactly the, the the core of it that for downlink it's not enough to just receive the uplink pilot and then complete uh, compute the complex conjugate you need this alignment between the antennas. They have to be jointly calibrated for reciprocity or synchronized for reciprocity or aligned for reciprocity, whatever. There are a couple of different terms here that all mean the same thing. I tend to say calibration, even though calibration to a lot of people in, implies that you tune a, a small pot with a screwdriver, but it's not really what's going on here, right? This is more like actually estimating things. So maybe synchronization is a better word, I'm not sure. Right. So. Uh how do we do this then if you have an array at the base station with many antennas how can we accomplish this kind of synchronization yeah. this is some basic principle yeah so this is a uh, this is a tricky topic okay mm -hmm. <laughs> um but let's let's see if we can break this down so let's talk about first a co-located array mm -hmm. with ante of antennas and there's a lot of stuff going on in an array to start with. There are antennas, right? There's electronics and all sorts of stuff. And if these antennas are close, closely located to each other, there'll be mutual coupling mm -hmm. that will affect things back and forth. Now, and there's lots of misconceptions floating around as well about all these things, and let's not go there in today's discussion, but stay with the fact that when mutual coupling to start with is a linear and time invariant effect. There, there are a few things here. There's this load load pull phenomenon for example where the gain of an amplifier can be affected but when you speak to, to hardware designers they'll tell you that this only happens for poorly designed uh, hardware and, and poorly designed arrays so in, in principle this coupling is a linear time invariant effect and then when we speak of a channel uh, then well when we speak of the of the of propagation then we know about reciprocity holds yeah reciprocity of propagation always holds in physics. Mm -hmm. uh, but then when we, we speak of a channel, then we need to define what does the channel mean? When, what is the x of t in your model? What does this mean? So typically that's a voltage somewhere you define over something you can measure right in, in, your, in your circuitry. And the, depending on exactly how we define uh, what air quotes the channel means, uh, then there might be effects that need to be uh, compensated for here because of uh, coupling okay but bottom line is that these are linear time invariant systems so in principle pro propagation is is reciprocal between elements within the array and between antennas in the array and a mobile somewhere else mm. 
Um, so why would we need any sort of any reciprocity calibration here then or care about this matter at all? Well, um, for two reasons. So first, within the array, even though propagation itself um, is reciprocal because of the linear, linearity and time invariance, there will be electronics chains that aren't. Okay, there'll be analog filters, there'll be mixers, there'll be other components. And these components, their characteristics and the phase lag of the signal when it travels through these components will be slightly temperature dependent. I mm. think there might be some weak dependence like the, when these components age over time that they change in their characteristics as well. But the main effect here is, is that temperature affects the phase lag. And that in turn creates um, a... Um, well, a non-ideality that varies over time and needs to be compensated for. Yeah, uh, typically called reciprocity calibration in the array literature. The results of the, everything I've said here now so far assumes that, that systems are time invariant. Yeah, and that implies particularly that all antennas in this array are driven by the same local oscillator. So that oscillator might drift over time, but if it drifts, it phase its phase drift and its phase noise will affect all elements in the array in the same way right okay so is that a good thing or a bad thing <laughs> uh, what do you mean that the uh, oscillator drifts is can never be a good thing but the fact that it affects yeah at the yeah. fact that it affects all of them in the same way uh, maybe we don't need to to compensate for uh, something. let's not go there okay <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, but anyways bottom line here is that um, propagation is is uh, reciprocal mm. yeah but certain components of the hardware chains uh, mixers and filters and amplifiers aren't so there is a phase lag that varies slowly over time and they will need to be estimated and compensated for and this is all not true for a, a comp for a co-located array driven by a single local oscillator right and calibrating away these reciprocity errors that come from uh, differences in phase lag in the analog electronics chains that is typically done by measurements between antennas within the array yeah so basically right. like having one antenna transmit and the others listen having another antenna transmit and having the others listen and so forth and then solving an, an well a regression problem essentially to get per antenna an amplitude and phase for the uplink and another amplitude and phase for the downlink and from these estimated phases getting uh, coefficients that can be used to compensate the array such that it appears uh, reciprocal when beamforming to, to a mobile terminal. Um, right. right. So that's the essence here. Uh, these methods that rely on uh, transmission between antennas in an array, they've been around for quite some time and they are well tested in practice. Um, I don't know what goes into the main, like in, in the product lines of 5G equipment, but I'd think that something of this sort is bound to be there at some point. I mean, there are other ways of accomplishing the same thing, but that requires extra hardware components and a lot more complicated stuff. Right. Um, so I think it also might be worth pointing out that uh, in some literature, this transmission between antennas in the array is is called uh, that to exploit the mutual coupling which is not totally accurate uh, in terminology but I guess it's a we can yeah. still say like that but it's not totally accurate but mutual coupling has a very specific meaning in electromagnetics uh, so what's really exploited by this method is propagation from one antenna to uh, to another within the array right i guess this is what they call s parameters uh, uh, when people are working more with the uh, with antennas um, one of the way of explaining this uh, is also that the, the models that we are using in the complex space band this uh, uh, are sort of describing what happens uh, at the transmitter and the receiver 
uh, but not including all the electronics there because we are generating a radio frequency signal in the transmitter and then it flows through all this component you were saying, go over the air, goes through some other electronics at the receiver and then it sample and goes to the complex baseband. And the fact that these components are different between the antennas and different depending on which direction you are having uh, the transmission, these are the kind of things that you, you are dealing with. That's right. I mean, one more time for, for conjugate beamforming or maximum rate, ratio beamforming to work on downlink, then every antenna estimates the channel and uses that channel estimate, takes the complex conjugate and uses that for as a beamforming coefficients on downlink, right? But that assumes that these antennas are reciprocity calibrated relative to each other. <clears throat> and within a, a, a compact or a co-located array, that, that's uh, well tested how to do that by performing these measurements between the antennas. And again, I mean, explaining all the, the details of that would would go, I think, beyond what we can accomplish uh, in, in a podcast show here. But it's uh, done in many papers, obviously. Yeah. But one last question regarding that aspect. So uh, when you have sent this signals around between antennas to figure out the mismatches uh, uh, and you want to compensate here, this compensation is done in the digital baseband or do you start to touch the hardware components as well? Oh no, I mean it's, there would be no reason to touch the hardware components since mm. all the beamforming anyway is done in software, right? I mean we're talking about like multiplying with complex numbers and in, in, in like a massive MIMO system the, the beamforming is also multi-user so there will be like superposition of different streams and all sorts of things going on so so, so that will be done in, in the digital domain uh, completely. I think another point to be made here that could be good to know for, for the audience is that when um, performing this inter uh, antenna measurements within the array to perform the reciprocity calibration, then propagation between antennas within the array is exploited. Huh? But there's no need here to make any assumptions on what that propagation channel looks like. So there's no need to know like how large is the face leg when I transmit from one antenna to the next, the face leg within the array. No? Mm. Uh, that, that, that's an unknown that can easily be eliminated from the equations. And all what remains in the end is this face leg that we have in the electronics, in the amplifier and mixer and whatever analog filter chain that depends on temperature. So that's the one that's being solved for here. Yeah. Right, so, and when you have uh, done all of this reciprocity calibration that you described. Uh, suppose I now would like to send the signal in the 30 degree angle out from my base station antenna uh, array. Uh, do I know everything I need to know in order to do this now? Huh, no. So that's a good question. Look, I mean, what I said here about um, reciprocity based beam forming and reciprocity calibration within an array. That goes for reciprocity-based beamforming and nothing else. Yeah. So there's measuring among the antennas within the array and solving for these unknown phase lags in the electronics um, uh, hardware chains. Um, that's perfectly possible. It can be done without any prior information about what the array looks like, how the propagation between antenna elements is like or anything. Yeah. But the result of running such an algorithm is only useful for reciprocity-based beamforming. This only functions if the mobile sends a, a pilot and this pilot is received and complex conjugated and all of that. It's not useful if you want to use the array for beamforming into a particular physical direction, so like your 30 degrees. So it's not useful if you want to do like fingerprinting of, for, for localization or anything of that sort. Now you need a different type of calibration, all right. uh, which is not as easy to accomplish. Uh, so that's a different thing. I don't know if we should go there because it gets in, 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 incredibly difficult to explain these technical points without really drawing on the whiteboard. But point is well taken here on, on, uh, on the fact that if you want to calibrate your array so that it can resolve a and really map received or transmitted signals to, f to, to physical angles, then number one, we need to know something about the geometry of the array, obviously. And number two, we need a different type of calibration as compared to the reciprocity calibration. Yeah. Right, yeah. So, so the, the mapping between all of the channel parameters that we get in order to, to deliver uh, data strongly at a certain location uh, based on pilots and the mapping to geometrical parameters like angles and these type of things, this is much more complicated. And, uh, and I think this is also... 
very important, even if we don't go into the details on how to achieve such calibration, that you need an even deeper calibration if you should use all of the signal processing methods that relies on sort of looking at channels, extracting angles, uh, uh, having like, uh, there's compressed sensing methods that looks at the received signal and try to figure out what angles were uh, there in the multipath environment. So, so this uh, might be much harder to achieve in practice. Indeed. All right. So suppose uh, you leave this co-located uh, array case where, uh, I mean, th that means all the antennas are essentially put at the same physical location in some uh, way here. And you, you start to spread out the antennas more and more. And would like to, to build a distributed array. Maybe it surrounds me here in the room, or maybe they are more spread out than that. Uh, can you still synchronize these things? You, you, you can, and I think for the discussion, I should stick to joint reciprocity calibration. So the, the target here is now that we have a mobile and they'll sense a pilot. And uh, pilot is received that is different antennas and it's complex conjugated and then is used for, for beam forming. Then. So the signal should add, add up coherently, right? And so the, the key thing here is that there is no difference in principle between reciprocity calibrating a co-located array of antennas or co-locate the distributed antennas, yeah? or small panels or whatever, or, or I mean, uh, distributed arrays, let's say. Um, joint reciprocity calibration among the elements can be accomplished using exactly the same technique, namely by pairwise bidirectional measurements between pairs of antennas. Mm -hmm. And this can be done without knowing the propagation distances. So we can put up mm. an antenna here, another antenna over there. We don't need to know the distance or anything between them. We can still calibrate them jointly for reciprocity by bidirectional measurement between them. Mm. So the, the difference or the distinction between the co-located case and the distributed case is that typically, in the co-located case, typically we have a single local oscillator that drives all the circuitry, right? Mm. So the source of reciprocity errors here is really only that th because of temperature mainly. The right. phase lag in the transmit and receive branches very slowly over time and it's quite stable, it's stable over many hours. I mean, w if the equipment is cold, you turn it on and it heats up, then the phase will drift. Yeah, quite significantly. You'll have to calibrate. Uh, but once it's warm, it, it kind of stays constant over a very long time. Uh, but in a distributed system, you might not have the same oscillator. You could have. I mean, so that's a design question. You build a distributed MIMO system. How are you going to distribute clock and, and, and phase? Will you have like a central oscillator somewhere and then some expensive cables that distribute the phase reference? Or will these antenna access points or, or antennas, will they have their own little local oscillator? Yeah. And yeah. if they have their own little local oscillator, then these oscillators, their phase will drift apart over time rather quickly. And once that phase has drifted apart by maybe more than, I don't know, I mean, if you, you need more than, if you're in the wrong half plane, then the, the beam forming won't work at all, right? So you'll probably want to be within 10, 20 degrees or something, or, or for null forming, you want to be much more tighter within a few degrees even. So every time the face of these local oscillators is drifted apart by more than some threshold value. You'll need to recalibrate for reciprocity, for joint reciprocity, in order for reciprocity-based downlink beam forming to work. So th therein lies the key difference. Not how we actually perform the calibration. It's the same technique over the air by measurements in between the antennas, but how often you have to do it. Right. So, so then that becomes more of a practical challenge perhaps uh, if you need to do it uh, much more uh, often it becomes a practical challenge because when you build when you, if you want to build distributed antennas or mimo systems then um, you could opt maybe for a solution where you have a central clock that generates could be a lower frequency i mean but it would have to be extremely stable and then that would be used to align the uh, local uh, clocks at the at the at the antenna so they, they don't drift relative to each other over phase yeah but but this requires like an and this re requires expensive hardware and, and cables and you know my vision is rather that no if we're ever to really gonna build distributed MIMO on any larger scale then 
these antenna panels or, or access points or just distributed antennas, they would have their own local oscillators. And for a local oscillator, it all comes down to cost, basically, how stable its face is over time. Yeah. I mean, if you put up like a million dollars, you can get something that goes into a GPS satellite or is atomic clocks that basically keep the face for, a, I don't know, a year, maybe a very long time, right? But if these are going to cost like 10 cents a piece, then the face might be off by, you might be halfway around the unit circle in, in a few milliseconds. I mean, so, wow. yeah. And, and then you need to recalibrate very, very often for, to, to maintain the joint reciprocity. So there, so there is this trade-off here. Um, how, good is the, how, how good are the oscillators versus how, how often you would need to realign the face? Right, and I think uh, both you and me have been working on these kind of distributed or cell-free massive MIMO scenarios in the hope of deploying a lot of antennas in a distributed fashion and maybe emphasize particularly what in performance improvement that could have in the communication parts. But do you think synchronization in such a scenario uh, will be so expensive that it's you can't build this at, at the... Uh, yeah, reasonable price. <laughs> <laughs> no, I let's not speculate about uh, about cost. Um, quite don't feel qualified to do that because it's just you know it all depends on how the market uh, evolves and and all of that, right? Um, so I would, but but if I had to, to bet on something, I would say no. But I think quite generally one would want to keep the cost down, which means in this mm. case, not having expense, relying on expensive installations, deployments of cables for the purpose of synchronizing phase, but rather rely on his, or over the air measurements between antennas. And then mm. the question is, okay, so how often can we afford to perform such over the air calibration measurements? And that will determine how stable the oscillators have to be and in turn how much they will cost right so <laughs> yeah. i think we probably should approach the question from the other angle that from a, a, a calm theoretic theoretic point of view how often could we afford recalibration yeah and yeah it, this is it, not exactly. such an easy you know many of these problems they, they seem like at the surface yeah this is something somebody will solve in the lab right so we don't care but actually some of these problems are they're super important and they have a lot more intellectual depth than it seems at the surface and uh, they're quite challenging to, to, to solve and I think there is a, an untapped there's a quite a b bit of research problems here that, that you know <laughs> um, simply will need to be addressed right for example if you if you think of it in a TDD system then we have a TDD timeline so we do uplink and then downlink and then uplink and then downlink but now if we have antennas or access points that suddenly need to talk to each other in order to align their face or calibrate themselves for to each other for reciprocity then one of them will have to transmit while the other listens so we'll have to break the tdd pattern here uh, which will have which will have implications in terms of okay but suppose that Here's an access point that was actually engaged in serving a user somewhere in TDD beamforming. And now mm. somebody tells us that, hey, you need to recalibrate your face and start talking to, not to that mobile, but start talking to another access point over there. Then who's going to take care of the mobile? I mean, and, and if there are latency constraints, this is not such an easy thing to solve, I think. So um, if you want good research problems, then here's a topic that what seems to me rather few people actually have uh, thought so carefully about and maybe are even aware of and uh, where uh, there's good potential actually to uh, <laughs> do many good things yeah yeah definitely uh, and uh, uh, as you were saying the important thing is that we will have a limited amount of resources to do this kind of synchronization in real systems so we need to do the best we we can uh, under those circumstances and I, I would guess that as we if we go up in frequency and use higher frequency bands to, then uh, you also in general needs to send pilots more often to to learn channels uh, and uh, then uh, you also are more short on resources somehow right so almost everything i know becomes more difficult when you go up in frequency so 
that is, that is true. I mean, I mean, mentioning here like research problems. There is also, of course, a potential to develop advanced tracking algorithms. Figure out how often do you need to perform this perform this recalibration, and hmm. um, maybe if you have in a heterogeneous deployment, you might have some antennas or, or access points that. Um, are maybe locked in phase or better locked or have more better quality oscillators and some that are cheaper and will need to be more often attended to and I can imagine a lot of uh, totally new research problems here. Mm. I think some of the mechanism that you have been describing now about how you send signal back and forth, uh, if I understood correctly, sort of is particularly the discussion is based on how do you provide the system with the observation that you need in order to sort of untangle the synchronization issues. Uh, uh, but uh, then even if you have enough observations, there will always be some estimation errors uh, left uh, in your, your the equations. Uh, yeah, uh, there'll so be noise, there'll be interference, there'll be non-idealities. Right. So yeah. between uh, every pair of antennas, there will be some kind of synchronization errors. If you now do this over a big system, will this error sort of accumulate and uh, break down somehow? Yeah. Or? That's a very good question. So. Uh, uh, so the question is really if you now perform uh, un- calibration measurements with the purpose of jointly reciprocity calibrating the antennas, you perform measurements between pairs of antennas, right? And then the question is, according to what topology should you actually perform these measurements? And if you have a large network, then could it happen that in one part of the network you're kind of locally synchro- calibrated, but in somewhere further away you're locally calibrated also, but then in between of these parts there will be large errors because errors accumulate as you like keep hopping mm-hmm. around between nodes in the topology. Uh, yes, and the short answer is yes, that this can definitely happen in fact. Um, and um, it's not such, such an obvious thing to, to analyze, no. <laughs> right. But th- there is some aspect of uh, divide and conquer here, I guess, as well, or a hierarchicalness that the different parts of the network can synchronize themselves at the same time, maybe not interfere much with each other, and then you can build up the synchrony between different parts of your network uh, as well. Yeah, I guess in practice you probably would want some sort of algorithms like that, but it actually turns out to be optimal to solve a single joint reciprocity calibration problem for the entire network and then use the result everywhere to compensate the phase when you perform your beamforming. Um, hmm. that, that, that's a basic result that can be can be proven. Right. Um, then in practice there might be other reasons that you want distributed algorithms, uh, obviously, but um, yeah, these are uh, intriguing questions. Yeah, <laughs> Yeah, I guess when we say optimal in, in the estimation theory area in terms of then uh, estimation performance, not necessarily. Oh, actually in terms of beamforming, in terms of beamforming accuracy in the end. Yeah, but the complexity could of course be huge with uh, the optimal schemes in these cases, so that can be a reason. That's too. right, complexity doesn't scale well when you when 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 you build when you make the network larger and larger no. hmm. right so uh, hmm. now we have covered this topic from many different angles and hmm. hopefully not lost too many <laughs> listeners <laughs> along the way uh, but for those who have been staying what else is there anything else to s- tell uh, oh i think there is i mean look you say we covered the topic i think it's more 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 accurate to say that we scratched the surface of the topic and right. mentioned a few aspects of it so um, uh, however i don't really feel that uh, it is possible to go in much more depth in a podcast conversation like this uh, no. more than to, that i hope that we've been able to make listeners aware of the sort of issues and, and perhaps inspire some to take a look at the, at the, at the papers that we have in yeah. the in in the field and think about the open questions and the open problems that uh, that are uh, there right so uh, then we will add some papers in the description of this episode in case you would like mm. to have more of a technical detail on this topic oh yeah absolutely let's do that yeah all right thank you very much for your enlightening uh, explanations of uh, this uh, topic well thank you emil 
yeah and then so also to the audience so um, remember that we we are on YouTube of course we also uh, on uh, Apple and Spotify and Google so the so the audio track of our conversations can be can be downloaded and you can subscribe on uh, on Spotify and on Apple and Google and uh, what else did I say? Spotify. I think those are, are all of the places. <laughs> That's right. Those are the places. Yeah. All right. So subscribe so you don't miss our next episode. And thank you very much for listening. Bye bye. Mm-hmm.